All right. Okay. Looks like it. Howdy, everybody. Hello. How's everyone's Saturday going? Great. Awesome. So you are here for If, Ands, or Buts, the totally true story of Cheek to Cheek. Um, you're going to see some, some butts. You will not leave disappointed. Um, but first, let's, let's, get a, let's get a round of introductions. Um, we, have, we have some lovely Keanu helping us out here. Um, first up here, gentleman to, my, gentleman to my right, is Adam Rickard. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a seasoned game jam veteran. I've done, uh, done them for many, many years. Um, I'm a professional game developer as my day job, and I'm also a returning GamerX panel speaker. I did a panel last year on body diversity. Um, and uh, this fellow is... Howdy. My name is Dream Sequence. <laughs> I am actually a ghost. Um, during the day, I am a professional developer as well. Um, my work on Cheek to Cheek was the first game jam that I had ever participated in. And uh, this is my first time talking here at GamerX. So that's really, really exciting stuff. So what's this panel going to be about? We are largely going to talk about our experience with the GX Dev Game Jam, uh, sexual objectification in games, and interactive storytelling? Question but mark? Mostly we're just going to be talking about butts. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lot of butts. Um, so we made something for uh, GX Dev, which was earlier, which was uh, earlier January, January earlier yeah. this year. Um, it was held at Pub, Pub, Pub Hub in San Francisco, which was super fun. Put on by the same fine folks that put on this shindig right here. And uh, there's some really, really cool stuff that you could actually check out at the arcade, including Cheek uh, Cheek. All, almost, I think all of the. Um, Games that were made at the at the game jam were all available to play over in the arcades. So, right. you know, if you like the, what you see in the panel here, uh, you can go play Cheek to Cheek over in the arcade later. So, what is Cheek to Cheek? Um, it's it's a visual novel. It's a dating sim uh, where you don't get to see anyone's face. Uh, it is it was the winner of two awards. One for the Prismatic Award for. Uh, representing a diverse cast, and also the hashtag such ridiculous award for being the beautiful, bizarre creature that it is. <laughs> um, originally, it was just an idea that Adam and I had that just kind of made us giggle like children. And <laughs> anything that made us giggle that much surely had to, had to be real. Um, so we're, so we're going to be talking about the project origins, some game jam strategies, and also some progress that we've been making on the game since the game jam. But we'll also be talking a lot about butts as well. <laughs> so picture it. San Francisco, 2015, January. GX Dev is coming up, and uh, Adam and I are talking about what we, what we want to make, and we start talking about what are the kind of things that prototype quickly in a game jam. Uh, GX Dev was... 48, 24 hours? Uh, 40, 48. 30, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's a limited amount of time. You only have a, so much so so much time to actually get a game done, and making games is actually kind of hard. There's all kinds of really fun middleware that can make that uh, slightly easier than it, than it can be, but it's still pretty difficult. And, and another thing to note is that neither one of us are programmers. So oh, yeah, bonus. That, that, puts a, <laughs> that puts a bit of a crimp when you're doing a game jam. Um, as I said, I've done a number of them before, and I, I kind of have gotten into the groove of what works and what, uh, what doesn't work so well uh, just from experience. And I know that most of the time, it's very difficult to make any type of game without a programmer. So this was a new experience for both of us. Yeah, absolutely. So we were talking about things that things that scoped uh, or had had pretty scalable scope, and the first thing that kind of popped into our heads was visual novels, which usually look like this, where it's a portrait of an anime character talking to you through lovely fixed static text, and they're not necessarily the most interactive, like the most complex thing from an interactive perspective. But hey, visual novels are story rich, really, really awesome. They have flexible art requirements. You can, you can illustrate a visual novel in any way you want to or not illustrate it at all. 
um, and a bunch, a bunch of the tools to make one of these things are, you know, a bunch of the tools are free or really, really, really cheap. So it's a, it's a really accessible medium, uh, especially for people that are uh, entering game development, people that are writers that don't have necessarily as technical of a background. So we thought that even though we do professional game development in our day jobs, um, we still needed something that had a low barrier of entry for us technical wise. Yeah, so um, we talked about our, our experiences with visual novels before. Um, I'd, I'd played a bunch of them. Uh, I love uh, narrative and story rich games, so that sort of fit my, my areas of expertise. I heard of Renpy once, and I've, yeah. I've, played, I've played a very, very small handful of visual novel type games, but none of the more current ones until uh, possibly Hot to Full Boyfriend came out. Yeah. So some of the ones that I'd played previously would be things like Long Live the Queen, or Had a Full Boyfriend, or a really, really bizarre one called Song of Seiya. And these are really awesome, interesting, completely bonkers stories, but they're kind of like the outliers of, of, the, of the genre. Um, they may be the mo most well-known over here, but they're not, really represent, they're not really a great representation of what the genre is typically kind of seen as. So this is what Steam looks like if you go and you type in visual novel. Anybody notice anything about all of these titles? They all have very similar, very similar themes, very similar art styles, very similar faces, very similar gender expressions, same body types, same, 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 same. So if everything is the same, nothing can be really great. So if, every, so if everything is terrible, then nothing is, is was kind of the motto that we adopted from a, a lovely website. And that might be somebody's thing, you know, like big booby ladies <laughs> drawn in an anime style with battle armor that doesn't make sense might be somebody's thing. And that's totally acceptable. That's totally cool. Just, just taking a stab at it. There might be a market for it somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I, oh, I'm, 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 yeah, I heard these heterosexuals are really into video games. Um, What's this world coming to? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> but the power of visual novels had more to offer us. Like, so we just started thinking about what really breaks the mold? What, what's going to surprise people? What's going to be different? Uh, so we went around and looked at other visual novels and we're like, all right, what is going to be the difference between all of these things and the thing that we're going to make? Um, most visual novels have a cast that is primarily made up of females. So for us, it was a really easy thing to be like, all right, majority of the people in our game will probably be male. Um, and for us, uh, non-female and non-gender, non-binary gender expression is a must as well. Um, no cat girls, no maid costumes, no senpai notice me, no, none, none of the stuff that's, that's just usual. You can find that in a million other places. That's, that's already catered to <laughs> quite well. <laughs> yeah. um, another thing that was really important to us is that, you know, people, have, people come in different shapes and sizes and colors that they need to be represented too. And it's very, 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 very rare in visual novels to see people who are outside of a real thin body structure it, it, or, or, or body frame. It's very atypical. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we include people who are older, younger, someplace in between, um, not just Japanese school kids over and over and over again. And stage of life is really important too. Are these people looking to date? Are they looking to be on their own? Are they looking to settle down? Are they just looking to kind of break bad habits that they find themselves in in their, in their dating? Um, and another really important thing to us was flexible gender expression. By, we didn't want to assume who the player was of cheek to cheek. Um, it could be male, it could be female, it could be somebody who doesn't identify along a binary gender expression. Um, so all of the text in the game is, is, is written to accommodate that. And that's really, really, really super important when so much of this genre is exclusively made for cisgender heterosexual males. What I really love about this image is the thought of someone being like all female but having a masculine arm. Yeah. <laughs> like, like someone's just got a feminine leg. I, just the one. <laughs> I have those days. I have those days. 
So we thought about who would be interested in actually reading something like that. Um, what would they get excited about? What would they want from this story? What would that voice sound like? Tina Belcher. <laughs> Tina is a strong, smart, sensual woman. Um, she writes erotic friend fiction. Lots of it. <laughs> lots of it. I mean, there's, there's Sexy Simpsons in there, which is kind of a given, but erotic I, ER? I really, I, I really feel there was a, lot, a missed opportunity for Sexty Minutes. Or, <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of puns they missed out on in this. <laughs> yeah. So what would Tina write? Um, she would write an atypical, we felt that she would write an atypical romance novel. It'd be slice of life daydreams with semi-realistic uh, consequences in there, but maybe a little touch of fantasy. Maybe not necessarily, she might write something that's a little bit more zombie driven, but we wanted to keep it a little bit more down to earth. Um, and it would, yeah, it'd be about one more thing too. Maybe about butts. <laughs> maybe not necessarily Jimmy Jr.'s butt, but you know, butts. So this was the eureka moment. This is when we knew that we had something that like, this, this had to, this had to be made. And we realized by being about butts, we weren't about butts at all. Um, every, every booty has a butt. It's, 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 it's one of those things that it, it would, by focusing on butts, everyone could be sexually objectified in a safe way. See, and you can't, you can't do that with the front because if you just made a game about vaginas or just made a game about dicks, yeah. you're gonna leave people out and then that's not cool. Like, but everybody's yeah. got a butt. But everyone has a butt. Everyone can share in that joy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it also gave, a, it, it, you know, my experience with visual novels uh, had shown me that surreal and surrational visuals played straight can work. That's stuff like How to a Boyfriend and Song of Saya. Uh, How to a Boyfriend is a dating sim about dating pigeons. Song of Saya is like this Cthulian anime nightmare where you also kind of date somebody, it's really weird and gets kind of icky in non-consensual there's, ways. There's also a few others that I found. One of them is a, um, a visual novel that was put out by, I think, Epson, and it's, you date Japanese printers. <laughs> like, <laughs> is the strangest thing. It's, it's played off entirely like a normal visual novel, but it's, you're dating printers, and there's, there's one scene where the, um, the printer is like spiking a volleyball and its lid is open, like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just think, I'm just imagining that being set to playing with the boys, so it could be like a Top Gun volleyball, volleyball scene. scene. <laughs> The, 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 the printers are glistening when sweat in the, in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but finally, uh, it was what, it, by being about butts, we thought about what the objectification of characters' butts meant to visual novels. In visual novels, you see female characters objectified mainly through their bust and having little other character dimension to them. Um, it, it was our opportunity to kind of bring attention to, hey, look at how ridiculous this is. If this, if, if this was done on any other body part, would it, would it be acceptable? Would it be okay? Maybe the follow-up can be a game all about shoulders. <laughs> yeah, sexy shoulder blades would be great. Also, butts are just funny. I mean, just saying the word is pleasurable and amazing. So with that in hand, it was in Tina We Trust, and we we went along to the lovely Game Jam. So we'll talk a bit about uh, Game Jam strategy now and what worked for us. Um, so from my experience uh, doing Game Jams, the things that I found is planning beforehand is the number one best thing you can do um, or don't. It depends on the approach you want to take. If you have an idea in mind and really want to work on it, planning is great. If you just want to go with the chaos and are, and are free to you know, try new things, then sometimes it's great just walking in and, and you know, throwing caution to the wind and just deciding, I'm going I'm to uh, you know, play this out how it goes and, and just go with it. Yeah. Um, Adam had to suffer with my OCD. I make lists 
and I love the plan, so I don't think you had much much of an option there. The cray is strong in this one. Yeah, it's, it's all right. <laughs> so the, the biggest thing I can say, though, is boot up your computer the night before or the morning of, because the worst thing, and I've had this happen a number of game jams so far, nobody wants to wait a couple hours for updates to install, and that is inevitably the thing that, that, <laughs> that causes, causes the beginning of the game jam to be, be slowed down a few hours. Um, keep the scope small. And it's okay to be ambitious, but try to work within your team's existing skill sets. Um, maybe don't aim for a 3D MMO as your first game. Um, the first game jam I did, we did a, a first person shooter in 3D and I had to uh, model, rig, and animate uh, two full character models, not having any clue how to do that. So it worked out, but it was also way more stress than I needed for, for I could have had more fun focusing on something that was uh, maybe easier to do, but more time consuming. Yeah, and, and at the end of the day, this experience, uh, the experience of a game jam should be fun. Yeah. It shouldn't be work. It shouldn't be something so, tor too torturous. Well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I, different people have different approaches to it. I always say, like, don't go in expecting to win. Go in expecting to have fun and learn something. Um, so at most of the game jams I've done, I go in with the expressed desire to do something I have not done before in a previous game jam. So if I go in and I'm like, I haven't animated a character, so I want to do character animation this time, or I haven't done pixel art, or I haven't done 3D in a while, like I'll go in and be and say, hey, you know, are there any games using this? I would like to work on this specific thing. Um, so it's great because it's a very uh, uh, fast-paced, high-pressure type of scenario to learn in, but it also gives you uh, kind of a framework without any real structure to it to explore things that you might want to know how to do but don't, uh, wouldn't have an opportunity to do outside. Um, and go in with an open mind and experiment with things. Like that's the beauty of game jams is that they're, they're largely experimental. And so you can try out ideas like butt dating sims or you know there was a game once that, um, that I worked on where you played as a bear and you had to hug people to get oxygen and it was simultaneously first person, second person and third person cameras on the same screen and it was crazy. Um, <laughs> and it, those kind of ideas you just won't have opportunities to play with outside usually. So it's great, it's a great breeding ground for like neat new ideas. Uh, and also try to get everybody on the team working on something as soon as you can. Uh, a lot of what I've seen is that there's a lot of design work that goes in the beginning, and so the um, you might have artists that can't do anything until there's some sort of design framework set. Um, usually programmers can start uh, talking amongst themselves early, and designers can talk amongst themselves, but the artists kind of get left out, audio guys left uh, get left out. So you, there's a, um, you, you want to try and get everybody working to be as productive as possible. So yeah, having a vague idea, sometimes having a vague idea is really good, something that you're not necessarily married to, but you can adapt and kind of work it, work it within everyone else's ideas and making it super fun. Um, I'm somebody who loves to keep something, to, to keep projects super small and really, really polish one particular area before moving on. Uh, so something that's, something that's uh, within scale, sort of like how wide the content is, how many, like how many who's a what's it's are you gonna be featuring, and then in scope, in terms of how deep the gameplay is, it's like what what number of things can you do with each who's a what's it? And uh, I I this is necessarily me talking. Uh, I prefer a small team size because that allows everyone to get a little bit more invested in how the how it's going to be coming together. Um, I, I, I found that that's a good. It a encourages good thing people too. to try different things outside when, of their usual. When realm. you have to wear more hats, you end up uh, kind of branching out a bit. Um, with really big teams, it's difficult in the time frame that game jams allow to really uh, utilize that many people. You just yeah. can't. You just can't organize it well enough. And it's pretty rare that you get into a game jam and somebody volunteers to be producer and really gets excited about that. <laughs> You should I've be seen, getting your hands dirty. <laughs> I've seen it happen, and it's usually people that they're producers in their day job or they're writers in their day job. Mm. And um, you know, I, game jams are, are strange in that you everybody wants to contribute, but sometimes they might not know how. And if you don't work in a specific area, you might not know how how they can contribute. Um, usually, project managers managers is the one area that I see that a lot, where they really want to get in there and start a JIRA project. And it's like, oh, you're overthinking this. Like, doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, but 
what I've usually found is that in the first few hours, you want your designers to start brainstorming as soon as possible to get as much framework set. They don't have to design the systems individually, but just getting like a base that uh, can get everybody else working is a really good idea. Um, artists tend to want to get your visual style nailed down pretty early and decide on uh, like what, what uh, kind of systems you want to use to trade assets and collaborate with things. Uh, programmers usually get together to find out like what programming languages does everyone use? What, what uh, programming systems are we gonna be using? Um, audio tends to a lot of times get left, uh, left to like the second day, it gets left out largely because um, the people that do audio are really passionate about it and then the people that work on the rest of the game development don't really know where to include them in the process and it's unfortunate because the audio can make games really, really awesome and it doesn't get thought of early enough in a lot of cases. Um, especially if you have a team that wants to make an audio-based game, it's really, really important to get the audio person in on the design phase, get them in early. Uh, and then project managers, you know, herd them cats. Like, that's all I can say. <laughs> you know, if you, if you do project management, that's great. You need somebody to kind of figure out what to do with everyone and keep everyone on task. But it's kind of a, uh, a strange uh, position to be in for a game jam because it's so tight and so, uh, so fast paced that it's difficult to really use traditional uh, project management software or systems to, uh, to manage everything. Everybody's working at 1,000 miles an hour. So kind of on that note, something that helps me is kind of to just get to just get organized is to write out either like a mission statement or a list of features, the things that, things that you want this project to accomplish. And because of the time that, are, that is usually involved with, with a game jam like this, uh, you want to cut it in half, then you want to cut it in half again, and then on that list of leftovers, there's like two things that are just so important to you that you really, really, really want to do these things. Uh, those are the two things you're probably going to actually get done. If lucky. Yeah. If, if lucky, you might get them done. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's something. So, so now, now we're, now we're going to yeah. now we're going to talk about the cheeks, about the, about the game itself. <laughs> it's kind of hypnotic. <laughs> just, just, just yeah, watch just, Yeah, one more time. There we go. Okay, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> So the writing process, how my brain works for this project was to just work on it kind of chronologically, work on the story chronologically. Um, I created a basic asset list for Adam so he could be work cranking away on arts, background, characters, all, all that kind of fun stuff while I was writing some lo uh, lovingly dramatic text to go with it. Um, and my, you know, everyone, everyone should probably be using Google Sheets or Google Docs to track everything, but for in a game jam, it's super, super important that everyone understands what everyone is doing at any given time. So having a living document that everyone shares together was something that was really invaluable for us. Yeah, we've we've found that you know Google uh, tends to be the best process for. Uh, especially for like asset lists, things that are evolving continually. Um, you know, I might, I might look at it and see, okay, there's three items on here. At least it gives me something to start on. And then I finish the first two items and look at the list again. And now it's like up to seven items because, um, you know, the writing may have caught up with it. And all of a sudden we've got a bunch of new characters. So it's, it's a good way to collaborate in a short term um, in a way that doesn't require you emailing back and forth. It's just, it's a really convenient way to do it. Uh, so I ended up kind of writing what the, the voices in my head told me to at a point in the game jam after you just don't sleep for so many hours. It is just caffeine and anxiety medication <laughs> uh, speaking. The game gets really weird towards the end. Really, really weird. <laughs> Um, so I ended up overwriting a lot. You can tell when he hits that like 3, 4 a.m. slump. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the words are still coming, but they don't, just don't mean anything. Um, don't, don't do that. You want to sleep sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, if maybe that's the type of game you want to make. So yeah. Yeah. it just, just depends on the message you want to deliver. <laughs> True. True. Uh, but yeah, so he ended up overwriting a lot. To the we, point, we we got to only see the first like the first day two days yeah in the demo that that, that we showed off the judges yeah um, the the game was basically the writing was basically finished for the entire game yeah and there wasn't enough time to implement it all 
<laughs> uh, you know, on the, on the art side, like I had most of the art assets finished, but we were trying to just shove all of this in there and there was just so much writing and it was great and I'm like, I don't want to cut anything, but we just physically didn't have enough time to put it all in. So I, I thought that was a funny point that the game writing wise was like entirely finished by, <laughs> by the time the jam was done, which is by itself a, a pretty colossal, um, it's crazy. Oh yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, so the art asset process uh, was pretty similar. Um, the art asset lists are definitely your friend. Um, that was something that uh, early on I, I kept hammering away. I'm like, you know, what are the locations? What what are the characters? What props do I need? Like, what do I need to find reference for and draw as much as as fast as possible? Um, syncing up with Google Drive is great. Resource libraries are also great, especially if you previously looked or worked on projects and you want to find you know, references for certain types of architecture or certain character design things. Um, having reference images is, uh, w will save you so much time. Same thing with like Photoshop brushes, patterns, any kind of uh, art assets that you can uh, reuse or cobble together make the process uh, go a lot faster and that's um, it's something that it just, you build up over time working as an artist. The research process went a bit like this. <laughs> I, I, was, I was prepared to see a lot of butt. Glorious. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared to, for the assault. <laughs> just, just the onslaught. <laughs> um, after, after 48 hours of staring at butts, things get a little weird. I, I learned a few things about myself, including that anatomy drawings not my strong suit, and that the visual style choices we had made early on were still unclear and kind of confusing. And so it was difficult to try and figure out what I was trying to make art for when I didn't understand the reference. So, so it was a very, it was like a very, it was me, Steve Urkel on the side there. Like, I'm like, oh, what's going on? Um, and it, it was something like this. You know, basically we were trying to go for art style similar to like, um, you know, Memphis art movement, Saved by the Bell background, something that's like really screams 90s, but trying to translate that over from uh, from its original medium, which is largely photo-based, into something that's hand-drawn is a difficult process that I wasn't really prepared for because it's not an art style that I've worked in a, a lot. So by the end of the ga game jam, I think both of us had learned a few things. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I learned that uh, RenP is amazing. It is this freeware tool where you can make a real game and it's really, really easy to set up. It's really easy to get started. Um, it has a, a fantastic, as somebody who doesn't program, I think it has a pretty fantastic debugger because I was able to figure out exactly how I messed up. Uh, it's oddly stable and cross-platform, uh, not too many publishing options, not a whole lot of frills. Um, we learned to do something that really speaks to, to us. Uh, if, you know, both of us were professional devs during the week, uh, this was our opportunity to make something that was Crazy, weird, silly, scary, but at the end of the day, ours. And that's a really cool thing. Uh, and I think that our passion for subject matter helped translate into something special on screen when, when we were able to show it off. Uh, it is totally weird to be, or it's totally okay <laughs> to be weird. And it is also weird to be okay. Um, <laughs> One of our awards was, was, was winning the Such Ridiculous Award for just being the craziest, most insane thing present. And yeah. I think that that's... <laughs> I think it was accurate. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's okay. I think that's, I think that's beautiful and, you know, you know, filth is our life. That's a beautiful thing. So at the end of, at the, end of the 48 hours, uh, we had basically something that was a novella. Uh, there was 25 major branching points, 11 endings, it took about an hour to go through the game the first time that you just clicked through it. Uh, if you wanted to find all the endings, that was closer to two hours. We had seven unique butts. It was beautiful. Uh, each it was, with multiple it was bootyful states. even. It was multiple states. <laughs> it, it brought a tear to my eye. Uh, and as we mentioned, two, those two awards earlier. Um, since GX Dev, things got a little weird. It was kind of cool to see Cheek to cheek up on Polygon. That was awesome. To see it get picked up by like Daily Extra or other, some other gay, gay blogs and gay magazines online, that was super cool. That's, that means that there are people out there waiting for this, waiting for Tina Belchers of the world to make something preposterous. Hold, hold on, you're telling me <laughs> that there are people that like butts? 
I know it's crazy. I, uh, I, I didn't. I didn't think. I didn't think they were there, and yet there's so many people here. Um, but we also found in the comments section, like everything else, um, not everyone wants to get it. Not everyone can get it, and it's impossible to please everyone. And that's totally okay, because. Just because the thing that totally appeals to, to us isn't going to necessarily be the thing that appeals to them, much like how the big-breasted anime lady with nonsensical battle armor did not appeal to me. That's totally okay. It's magical, though. It's yeah. magical battle armor. <laughs> so let's talk about fun things, fun things that have been added since the game jam. Uh, we had some friends go through the, through the full script, and they really enjoyed it, and they kind of encouraged us to help make it a real game. Uh, we've added new characters, we've added endings. We are up to a total of 13 endings, which is kind of crazy. Uh, we expanded one character, that's our kind of half, and added two brand new characters. Uh, Adam is working on some lovely HD art, artwork to, to go along with it. And I had the lovely task of converting our script from uh, RenP to Tyranno Builder. This is a program that you can get on Steam for 15 bucks. It's a little bit easier to use than RenPy, and uh, it has a lot more publishing options and a few other doodads that are kind of make doing the kind of game that we're, we're wanting to make a little bit easier. Um, so Re RenPy is great, but it can really only export to Windows, Mac, and um, Linux. Yeah. So it, it, we were looking for something that was going to have better support for exporting options, better support for in-game things like particle systems, just kind of more polished elements that we just weren't really able to add with RenPy. Uh, so converting kind of took a long, long, long time. It was a process that couldn't be scripted or, or easily automated but this gave Adam some extra time to, be, to get a head start on some of our artwork. But um, life finds a way <laughs> to get in the way. And uh, during the last year, we've had a lot of, um, a lot of things happen. You know, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, we both have uh, day jobs. I started a new job in February and was really focusing on that, and, um, and it's been going great. But as a result, you know, things like like side projects uh, kind of don't get quite as much love as, as you would like sometimes. So what we ended up deciding on is um, to make this a more casual development cycle. You know, take less stress about it. It's not something that um, we need to finish to pay the bills, but it's something that we're finishing because it's a passion project and we have, um, you know, our day jobs uh, put food on the table. So those are the things that really, we give that the attention that it deserves and then the, the side project gets the, the love we have left over. Uh, so now we're gonna show some of the art from the game, some of the new art from the game. So this is, <clears throat> this is one of the main characters, Jack, and he's the uh, owner of, uh, the main store that your character works at. The Beach Bums yes. surf shop, it's beautiful. <laughs> so we wanted to have a character that was more, um, a little more mature, a little more kind of uh, bare body type, um, which we, you don't really see in, in visual novels at all. You see it sometimes in, in uh, manga, in the Bara style, but um, as far as gameplay, it's not, not something that's, that's given a lot of attention. And we also wanted to mix it up and have some different, uh, different body types. So we've got, you know, like more muscular, we've got uh, more feminine, we've got um, different, different shapes and sizes. Uh, we wanted to give it like a good mix of different types. So you're probably asking, when can you play this lovely, atrocious, horrible game? Uh, <laughs> you can play the old version that we had, that, that's currently uploaded. Uh, for uh, submission to the Game Jam mm -hmm. at GX that, Dev. That's over in the arcade. It's over in the arcade. Uh, but what we've been working on is a new demo that we are calling the Badonka Demo, and it will be available early 2016. It'll have new art, more content, and it will be all totally free, which will be super rad. And then we're gonna have a full release uh, later on next year. So thank you for listening to this insane babbling. <laughs> like, y'all took your time out of your day to be here, and I really appreciate that. Um, and, this, and that's a lovely time when we open it to the floor and ask if anybody's got any questions.
Yeah, that, the, yeah. The, the demo ends at the end of that because the, the amount of implementation we had for the original Game Jam, we had the script all written to the very end. We had most of the art assets done, but just getting it all implemented took longer than the Game Jam had. So that there's a, total, there's a total of eight days, and each day varies in terms of length and duration. And as you, as you progress through more and more, uh, like with each day, some of the choices become more compounded with previous choices that you've, that you've already made. So it gets a little bit more, it gets more layered as you, as you move through it. We haven't decided yet. That's a very good question. Yeah. That hasn't been really solidified yet. To, uh, definitely PC, Mac. Yeah, Tor Torano Builder <laughs> can export to um, pretty much everything right now. So I think the best option might be to do like HTML5, just so it's as, as cross-platform as possible. But we haven't, we, we haven't quite gotten to that point yet of deciding like what our, what our final release projects are going to be. So. Anybody else? Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Is this the state of the release? So we're planning on releasing a new demo um, early 2016. Um, the full version we're planning on releasing later, later in 2016. So it's, uh, it's in the works, but it's, uh, <laughs> there still has some polish left we need yeah. to do. Have you tried to see um, How do I answer this nicely? Yes, um, <laughs> I would, I would, I would, I, I would love us to be spared the pain of green light because I've, I'm, a, I'm slightly worried about how some people may may look at this game and respond to respond to a green light campaign to it. It's a it's a project that deserves to be seen, but it's a project that might not do well in an arena style battle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm I, so so yes, I would I would I would love my my dream of dreams is to someday go on to Ste the the Steam page for visual novels and see cheek to cheek. Right next to "Had a Boyfriend" holiday star, that would, like, that that's, that 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 would mean that we made it. <laughs> it would, it would, that would fulfill me. <laughs> well, I think. Well, Adam yeah. and I will hang out here for a little bit, but yeah. I think that's thank it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming by. Most appreciated. <laughs>